The last topic is Neurodynamics of the Mind by Dr. Gautam Das. He is Professor and Head of the Department of Mental Health and Neurobehavioral Medicine, MAP Institute of Medical Sciences and Research, Senior Consultant, Apollo First Meta Hospitals, Consultant Neuropsychiatrist. Sir, please. When I was asked to give this talk, I was wondering uh, what topic to take. And it occurred to me that most people I meet ask me whether I am a psychologist and whether I do counseling. So I thought that it is time I talked about how the face of psychiatry has changed in the last 15 to 20 years, especially after I did my PG. Some of you may have seen this uh, picture. Can anybody tell me what is wrong with this? It is a waterfall. Those who have already seen it, uh, please don't respond. Others, can you tell me, is it all fine or is there anything wrong with it? There's a nice waterfall and you water can see up. water is going up. Exactly. You can see that the water is actually falling down and then flowing upwards. Is that possible? No. So this is an optical illusion. So it is not possible for the water to flow upwards after flowing down. So let us look at what is known as emergenetics. We look at different kinds of people and think that each of us has got a different kind of a brain. So here for example, they say if you are social, if you are a social thinker your brain is red, if you are a conceptual thinker your brain is yellow, if you are an analytical thinker your brain is blue, and if you are a practical thinker your brain is green. So everybody thinks that each of us has a different kind of a brain. The fact is that it is not true. The other thing that happens is what I call a dichotomization. People say that biological malfunction is the foundation of all mental disorders. Another group says only pathology of thinking and behavior gives rise to mental disorders and everything comes because of faulty learning. <coughs> then there is what I call reductionism. Everything is reduced to the most simple thing. That uh, typical cartoon there says sociology is just applied psychology, psychology is just applied biology, biology is just applied chemistry, which is applied physics and so on. So everybody wants to get onto the bandwagon and say that this is my area. And there are others who say that all mental disorders are due to chemical changes in the brain. And another group will say that all mental disorders are due only to experiences. Now an interesting incident happened sometime in the late 1980s when the Dalai Lama was visiting the US. And he was witnessing a neurosurgeon. So he asked the neurosurgeon whether or not a mental activity or thought could affect the physical structure of the brain. Remember this was the 1980s. The neurosurgeon said, no, that's not possible. He did not know what the Dalai Lama knew and which we know today. And that is that the brain is an open system designed for learning. And it is a two-way process. Learning is a two-way process. The brain is constantly interacting with the environment. 
it's a dynamic force and it exhibits changes and the changes are permanent so experience with the environment causes a durable change in the brain <coughs> so let us look, look at what I call the Ardhanari concept of the mind we are looking at an integrated approach today neuroscience has started to identify neural correlates not only of mental disorders but also of mental processes we know that every single mental process has a neural correlate so I would like to give you some food for thought can psychotherapy or counseling bypass the brain and bring about changes can psychotherapy or counseling correct behavioral and emotional symptoms without changing anything in the brain does psychotherapy or counseling produce durable corrections in brain biology and does the brain as a command or control system determine thinking unilaterally so these are some things that require thinking about so all these years the elephant has been sitting in our the elephant has been sitting in our clinics and we have been ignoring that elephant we have been living almost a delusion that the mind is functioning independent of the brain path breaking technologies like neuroplasticity have linked psychotherapy with neural changes it has showed that where your mind goes the neurons fire and where the neurons fire new connections are made in the brain Philip Candle in 1998 showed that synaptic connections in the brain permanently altered by learning so any learning that you do for example if you are learning something today that means there is a permanent synaptic connection being produced in your brain right now and every learning process uses memory so memory is intricately linked here a taxi driver study was done in London where in London I don't know how many people know the taxi drivers and bus drivers have to get a license and that license include that they have to learn and write an exam on every route that they have to drive through so which means bus drivers have a limited route to learn whereas taxi drivers have to know each and every nook and cranny of London so taxi drivers have a much more complicated learning experience so when they did an MRI of bus drivers and taxi drivers before they undertook the one month training program and after they finished the one month training program they found that the hippocampus of taxi drivers enlarged to almost double the size of that of the bus drivers so memory is of two kinds we have what is known as episodic memory which is otherwise what I call conscious memory it is memory of things you do every episode for example you have come here you have attended the CME you have uh, attended some lectures you have learned something this is all episodic memory it is all put into your episodes then you have the procedural memory for example some of you may have driven here and while you are driving you are probably thinking of something else and automatically you are performing the movements the car is moving somebody is coming across you are automatically avoiding him all this is what I call unconscious memory or procedural memory and the episodic memory is in the hippocampus all these days we used to think that only hippocampus controls memory but today we know that hippocampus only controls episodic memory whereas procedural memory is controlled by amygdala connections by the amygdala so you have the hippocampus and connected structures which give rise to episodic memory 
and the procedural uh, memory which is involves the basal ganglia, the cerebellum and the amygdala. And the procedural memory, believe it or not, is fully developed by the child is three months old. So a three month old child can learn something which will affect it 20 or 30 years later because it is encoded in the procedural memory. And once something is learnt with conscious effort, it becomes automatic. Like we heard surgeons today. And what they learnt with conscious effort when they were interns, now they are doing it automatically. <coughs> so the developing nervous system is a homeostatic system in which learning is produced by environment and early experiences are interlocked, put into procedural memory and become unconscious processes that affect the daily functioning later on. Then we also have brain circuits. There are different circuits in the brain. You have all the sensory inputs coming in and they come in and when they come in, two things happen. One is, they go through the thalamus, the relay center, and from there to the amygdala, and to the rest of the neocortex. At the same time, if it is a new episode <coughs> that you are learning, it goes through the conscious memory or the episodic memory, and then to the neocortex, which involves the frontal, parietal, temporal lobes. And if it is something that you are doing automatically, like driving, then it goes it bypasses everything and automatically goes to the amygdala. So the amygdala is closely linked to your unconscious procedural memory. And we'll see how that affects your behavior. So this is what is called the neural circuit switchboard. The neural circuit switchboard has a circuit of the amygdala, the limbic system, the hippocampus, the striatum, and the autonomic nervous system. So this is called the neural circuit and emotion and memory circuits are intricately linked to the neural circuit. <coughs> now if you take the neocortex, we said that it is linked to the neocortex. Now within the neocortex itself, there are different areas dealing with different functions. For example, the parietal lobe deals with self-representation. Who am I? I am here, I am standing here, I am standing in front of a number of people and I am talking. So that is my self-representation and my parietal lobe is telling me that right now. Other representation is dealt with by the temporal lobe. There are people in front of me, they are all looking at me, they are all attending on me. That is done by my temporal lobe. Self-action. You know, I am standing, I am talking, I am making all these gestures. That is done by the limbic system and that is also linked emotionally to the emotional center. And other action that you are all looking at me, I am watching your responses, how you are responding to what I am saying, which is why I wanted some of the lights on. That is again the limbic system and that is again tied to the emotional area. Now all these are interconnected to the amygdala before the action is produced. So the amygdala ultimately controls what I do. So what I am saying now, the emotions that I am feeling, the emotions that I am expressing, all of it is being filtered by the amygdala. So let us take a case of autism. Here in autism you find that none of these areas are functioning. If you do a functional imaging study, you will find that none of these areas are functioning. So an autistic child does not have any representation of self, does not have any representation of others, and does not have any representation of what it is doing or what others are doing. So it just does what comes to its mind. Asperger's, as you may know, is a milder form of the autism spectrum. So here, the Asperger's uh, child will have self-representation, 
will have other representation, will be able to uh, do self-action, will be able to respond to other self-action, but then it will be in a world of its own. So the action part of it, its self-action, what it puts out, will be highly controlled. So it will be able to do only certain actions and not all actions. And those certain actions will be highly developed. You take schizophrenia. Depending on the type of schizophrenia, the different parts will be overreacting, overacting. So when my other attention is overactive, I have the delusion that everybody is looking at me, everybody is talking about me, that what is coming on TV is all referring to me. Suppose my self-action is underdeveloped and the other action is overdeveloped, then I feel that everybody is controlling me. I, my actions are being controlled. So these are the delusions that you see in schizophrenia. And in personality disorder, depending upon which area is not functioning, you have different kinds of personality disorder. For example, suppose the self-action and self-representation are present and other action and other representation are not present, I don't care what the hell you think of me. I am a sociopath. I will do what I want and to help with all of you. No, I don't care. Your action doesn't count for me. Your attention doesn't matter to me. I will do what I want. Now the other important portion here is the orbital frontal cortex which is lying just above the uh, orbital cavity. Now the orbital frontal cortex acts like that smoke alarm there. Now that smoke alarm is supposed to detect a fire. But if I am celebrating a birthday here and I light a candle, it will only detect the smoke and think it's a fire and go off. So the orbital frontal cortex actually is a warning system which tells me when there is danger, when somebody, somebody is attacking me or when somebody is about to threaten me. Now if that orbital frontal cortex is hyperactive, then it becomes like that faulty alarm. Even the slightest action I can misinterpret and feel threatened. So I become afraid. I become afraid to face you. I become afraid to talk to you. So you get social phobia, social anxiety, various phobias and so on. Then the third concept that neuroplasticity is taught us is neural mirror. Now everything that I do is being mirrored. Everything that you do is being mirrored in my brain. So when you make an action, it is automatically being mirrored and I can repeat it. So suppose I want to learn to drive a car. I do not have to even drive the car or take driving lessons. That's how I got my license. I did not take any driving lessons. I just imagined all the things, how to put the gear, how to change the clutch, etc. I paid for in those days, got my driving license, <laughs> then got into a car and started driving. Okay. Now the neural mirroring helped me in that. So everything I, I did, I preconceived, I practiced and I was able to do it. So when there are two competing neural networks, then one can become dominant. Now how is that important? When there are two competing neural networks in the brain, one becomes dominant. And that is how we learn inhibitions. And that is how counseling or psychotherapy works. That is how yoga and meditation works. By neuronal strengthening. When you practice something adequately enough, then the neurons continue to fire more and more. Better synaptic connections are made and that action overrides everything else. So, neuroplasticity has taught us that learning behaviors and thinking during a psychotherapy, counseling or 
any other program <coughs> creates and strengthens a competing response that extinguishes the amygdala response. So the amygdala actually is called the riderless horse. You know, you are riding a horse where the reins are not in your hand. Your cortex has no control over the amygdala. The amygdala on the other hand can do whatever it wants as long as the cortex cannot control it. And this happens because of the orbital frontal cortex. So the orbital frontal cortex actually is sending signals to the amygdala to allow the cortex to allow it to control or not. So when you are reacting instinctively, you have heard of the flight and fright response. Suppose I bring a tiger into the room. What you do as an instinctive response is because the amygdala prevents the cortex from functioning. So there is no thinking. So you cannot think at that point of time and the amygdala just does what it wants and that is run. So this whole circuit is like a very complicated grade separator and everything is flowing very smoothly. I will just finish in a couple more minutes. Everything is flowing very smoothly like it does on a grade separator. So traffic jams are not there because there is a grade separator. So seeing pleasant things, experiencing pleasant acts, doing something of interest to you, enjoying leisure activities, all of it calms down the amygdala. It prevents the amygdala from reacting. So the stronger the competing response, <coughs> the greater the control of the amygdala. So this is known as self-directed neuroplasty. So by undertaking yoga, meditation, tai chi and all other training programs, you are creating strong neural circuits which are controlling the amygdala and preventing it from running away with your brain. So, psychotherapy or counseling seems to be based on cortical top-down mechanisms. But equally important, pharmacotherapy with medicines is based on subcortical bottom-up mechanisms which have the same effect as psychotherapy or counseling without the long time that is involved in bringing about the change. Doesn't mean the psychotherapy is not important. Psychotherapy is important, but today we know that we do not have the time. Psychotherapy takes six months, counseling takes one year. You have to go continuously, regularly, without fail. Now, the entire change that we can bring about with a long series of counseling can be done in a short time with pharmacotherapy. But it has to be supplemented with psychotherapy later on. So this is what I call opening up the mind. When a patient comes to us, their minds are closed. For example, a patient uh, came to me today, said, I am fine. Why should I come? Brought by the mother. Son has been brought by the mother because of various problems. Son is saying, I am fine. Why should I come? So the mind is closed. Now there is no basis for any psychotherapy or counseling. Probably it will take me 10 sessions to even convince him that it is worth coming for psychotherapy. So we open up the mind with medicines, with pharmacotherapy, which acts within a week or two weeks. And then the mind is open for psychotherapy. So the dualistic disti distinction is not valid anymore. It is a combined action that we are doing. So medication for short term relief, combined with psychotherapy or counseling for long term effect and permanency is the rule of the day today. And of course, we all enjoy the pleasant moment therapy from time to time, especially when we come to a CME like this. Thank you. Any questions? If no more questions. I think Professor Satyanarayana would have got the answer when, he, when I presented the Raju, Dr. Raju's 
memorial oration. Where is the mind? I think Professor Gautam Das has answered it very crisply. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Man. Yeah, thank you very much for patient caring. And the meeting comes to an end. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir.